Bună ziua! Mă bucur că ați decis să rămâneți la discuția de după vizionarea filmului. Lângă mine este Oleg Kozlovski. Am să încerc să-l prezint în câteva cuvinte. El este din anul 2000 activist, mai întâi membru al Amnesty International, după aia el s-a implicat în mai multe campanii politice ale opoziției ruse, mai recent în campania lui Alexei Navalny și de câtva timp este din nou uh, membru al Amnesty International, deci activist politic, activist uh, și luptător pentru drepturile omului și o să avem o scurtă discuție de, uh, împreună cu el despre democrația uh, în Rusia, despre ce înseamnă democrație în Rusia și Um, o să vă răspund și la întrebările dumneavoastră după ce o să încep eu cu câteva întrebări. Uh, o, discuția o să fie în limba engleză. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you. Uh, first I wanted to thank um, One World Festival and the Rocks Foundation for bringing me here and giving me this opportunity to talk to you. I'm here, of course, in my uh, personal capacity, not as a representative of Amnesty International, so whatever I say, it is my personal opinion. And um, watching or re-watching this uh, film, uh, of course, brings up my uh, personal memories because uh, I started my uh, activism just at the time when uh, action in this film uh, was taking place events of this film were taking place uh, in the year 2000, just before Putin became president. Uh, and uh, now almost 20 years later. So I was um, a high school student then. Now uh, my daughter is a school student already. Uh, I joined Amnesty International in the year 2000, then I left it. I uh, was a member uh, in several political opposition groups. Uh, I participated in various projects that helped the Russian civil society. And now I'm back to Amnesty International and Putin is still president. Uh, so I, I don't know if, if this is a loop or if life is just uh, um, has its own irony. Uh, but in fact, I didn't want to take much time uh, in a monologue. I would prefer to uh, to listen to questions from the audience or uh, from Anton. Uh, I don't know how much you know or how much you want to know about the history of Russia or the present state of Russia. Um, if anything, my experience um, was mostly in the sphere of human rights, democracy, public protests. Uh, I was a member of uh, the Union of Right Forces, which was briefly mentioned a couple of times here, which was an opposition party in Russia, a kind of semi-opposition party. Um, I participated in a lot of public protests. I've been arrested a few dozen times uh, and had some uh, various adventures and misadventures uh, in Russia. But uh, I think it's better uh, to uh, start with Uh, with uh, the question that often uh, comes up uh, when discussing the situation in Russia in general, it is whether Putin's rule was uh, more to the benefit or uh, did it harm Russia? And uh, I don't have, I think nobody can give uh, an exact answer to that because uh, on one hand, uh, there has been uh, economical growth. Uh, economically, we are better off now than we were 20 years ago. And uh, the price that was paid for it was very high on the other hand. And I think that we are just beginning to pay this price. Uh, earlier this week, I was in Chechnya. This is the uh, former breakaway republic. Now it is considered firmly within the Russian uh, political space. Uh, again, it was mentioned several times, Chechnya was uh, the place where two wars uh, were fought over the last 25 years. Uh, and it helped, in a way, 
propel Putin to power because the Second Chechen War, which started just when Putin was appointed, uh, was a very popular uh, so-called small, uh, little victorious war, uh, and Putin won uh, in a landslide in, in uh, 2000 thanks to his reaction to that war. Uh, so I was there uh, this Monday. Uh, it was my first and only time so far uh, in that place. And it's very, um, uh, it, it's not like other parts of Russia, but I think uh, it shows the essence of uh, changes to Russia under Putin. So on one hand, there are no signs of war, no uh, ruins, no uh, um, traces of bullets or uh, not even memorials to the war, like it never happened. If you were just a tourist who had never heard uh, of this place and never read the news, you would think it's just uh, a pretty nice place with a few skyscrapers even uh, in the city center where everything is more or less, uh, well, they're not wealthy, but they look pretty, uh, pretty good, right? Uh, on the other hand, the skyscrapers, and I lived in one of them, uh, the hotel was empty. Uh, myself uh, and a few journalists and human rights activists who came uh, there uh, were almost the only people who stayed at the hotel. Uh, and the other skyscrapers that were supposed to be office buildings also looked pretty empty. I, I don't know if anyone works there or if they just stand there to make the beautiful uh, skyline. Uh, so there is this Patomkin village uh, thing. Uh, but uh, what's worse is uh, the reason why I came there, uh, it was because there was a, a trial of a human rights defender uh, near the city of Grozny. Uh, basically, it was the last human rights defender in Chechnya. Uh, and he, uh, he was uh, in prison. He was sentenced to four years uh, in, um, in a prison camp uh, for allegedly possessing uh, drugs, which everybody understands uh, were planted. Uh, so this is just uh, to, to see these two pictures. One picture is what probably an ordinary person who never gets involved in politics usually sees. You, ha you can do some business, you can get some money, although uh, a lot of businesses uh, get uh, bankrupt or you can be unlucky if somebody uh, with uh, power likes your company and they want to take it away from you. But if you stay away from politics, you can expect to uh, live a more or less decent life uh, if you try to defend somebody else, or if you're just unlucky and uh, uh, some police officer wants uh, to improve their statistics uh, through putting you uh, in prison, you have no rights. Um, and this, this is especially visible in Chechnya, but this is uh, the situation more or less everywhere in Russia. Uh, like I said, we are just beginning to pay the price. I think um, more people, fortunately, in Russia are beginning to realize this, uh, and we see in the recent years that more people uh, want some changes in the country, but it's still a minority, and uh, still the uh, current regime is very well established. Uh, it, it is very well uh, kept uh, in power, uh, so I wouldn't expect any uh, big changes in this respect in, uh, in uh, near future, but we never know. Um, I guess somebody might have questions. Um, please, if you do have questions, raise your hand. And uh, in the meantime, I'll ask. Uh, uh, so I just want to uh, um, ask you a question. Uh, you were saying that economically for the majority of the people situation, the situation is better in uh, under Putin than it was under Yeltsin. People are living uh, economically speaking better, but something is lacking and some things are getting worse. And uh, since our meeting today is to talk about democracy in Russia, I was wondering if you could mention a few of the aspects uh, where uh, democracy is wanting. Uh, where 
democracy has a problem in Russia today, which is, might be worse than it was under Yeltsin. Yeah, uh, so to be sure, uh, economy-wise, things are better than they were in the 90s, which was the lowest, uh, at least early 90s, was the lowest point uh, in Russian uh, economy. Like in many other post-socialist countries, uh, for a variety of reasons, mostly because the economy had to restructure itself. Uh, that being said, there are many, still a lot of, a lot of uh, economical problems in Russia, and uh, especially since the annexation of Crimea and sanctions that followed, uh, things were getting worse for most Russians. Uh, and uh, even those people who Putin uh, was, who, who supported Putin for all these years, uh, the situation is getting worse now. Uh, for instance, the pensioners, who have always been the most loyal part uh, of, uh, of the society, uh, are now feeling that, well, soon to be pensioners now feel that uh, something has been stolen from them because their uh, retirement uh, age was, uh, was raised. But speaking of democracy, um, things that are probably most obvious to, uh, to uh, an ordinary person. Um, freedom of speech or freedom of expression. Uh, if you use um, a social network and if you post something on the internet, you can never be sure whether it's legal or not and what, uh, what it can lead to. For instance, if you post a meme that somebody considers uh, is uh, anti-religious or something like that, uh, there is a, a criminal uh, punishment for that. If you post something that may be uh, considered uh, offensive, uh, uh, to, uh, offensive to any social group, like police officers or, uh, I don't know, doctors, some, uh, any group whatsoever, there is a criminal punishment for that. Um, if you uh, post any neutral video that has uh, a logo of a certain organization which was uh, founded by Mikhail Khodorkovsky, who was also mentioned here. He was a former oligarch who spent 10 years in prison under Putin, then went uh, to Britain. And he founded an organization that, among other things, they make educational videos. And if you post it on your um, website, there is a punishment for that. Uh, if you try to hold a protest against, well, anything, it doesn't have to be political. It can be about salaries, uh, about uh, student stipends, whatever. Uh, you, will almost, you can almost always be sure that your protest will be banned, and if you show up, there is a punishment for that. Uh, and if you hold it uh, more than two or three times uh, during a year, uh, you can go to prison for up to five years. So uh, it's, it's a minefield. Uh, most people who are not very good uh, at following all the laws that uh, the Russian government uh, passes every month, uh, you can never be sure that whatever you are doing is legal. And even if it is legal, uh, if somebody uh, wants to interpret the law differently. Uh, so the internet, which used to be very free, uh, is now getting more and more censored. Uh, if you go uh, to a search engine like Yandex or Google, and if you uh, look for some news or uh, you want to look up some information about a politician, a member of parliament or somebody, you often uh, see this little comment in the bottom of the page saying that certain links have been removed uh, because of uh, government policies. And uh, it doesn't mean that these links uh, are false information. It just means that uh, the government instructed uh, the search engine, especially it, has, it works with the Russian search engines, but also with Google in some cases, to remove this link. Uh, if, if we talk about more mainstream democracy, like voting for a party, for a political party, no, not a, uh, not a pajama party or a beer party, 
Um, so uh, you cannot register a political party. And without registering it, you cannot participate in elections. So, uh, well, formally you can register, but there are so many technical uh, obstacles on the way to do it that uh, it's impossible unless the presidential administration likes you or uh, you, you somehow uh, make them uh, realize that you are not uh, dangerous. So, for instance, the most popular opposition politician in Russia, Alexei Navalny, has been trying to register his political party for, was it six or seven years? And he's a lawyer, if I'm uh, And he has a staff of lawyers who write all the necessary documents, uh, bring them to the Ministry of Justice, and they get rejected every time. Uh, and there have been a lot of uh, stories like that. Uh, so you cannot run for elections. If you want to run for presidential elections, like last year, each uh, candidate was informally uh, vetted by the presidential administration. And it's not even a secret. They almost talk about it uh, publicly because everybody knows this is the procedure. If you're not, uh, if the Kremlin considers that you are too dangerous or not loyal enough or they don't know what to expect from you, you just won't uh, be on the ballot list. So, uh, it doesn't even, uh, the elections uh, don't even reflect what people think. They only reflect uh, what the people in the Kremlin think uh, the main uh, candidates should be. And uh, the democratic instruments that Putin mentioned here, like how do you argue with the government? And Putin answered, you see it's very simple. There are democratic instruments, they just don't exist. Uh, the courts are completely controlled by uh, the government. Not only are they appointed directly by the president, uh, but there are many uh, different tools to control them on every step. So for instance, uh, if we talk about criminal courts, so if you are unlucky enough to be uh, prosecuted for something, for something that you haven't done, for instance, uh, and it happens, unfortunately, it happens sometimes in every country because there are mistakes. It happens even more often in countries with uh, corruption, such as Russia. Uh, the chance of you getting acquitted is 0.3%. Uh, so there is an informal limit of one acquittal uh, per year per court. And court uh, uh, covers usually tens, sometimes hundreds of thousands of citizens. Uh, so only one person can be acquitted in this court per year. If somebody has been acquitted earlier this year, sorry, you're just unlucky. Um, so, yeah, uh, these are just some examples. Um, hello, regarding the question of uh, nostalgia, which is uh, raised in the film, uh, the, the film suggests that uh, uh, the feeling of nostalgia of, uh, by some part of the citizens uh, was uh, really essential to, to Putin's approval rate in the first uh, year uh, after he was elected. Has the situation uh, changed so far? Is, is there still the nostalgia for the firm hand for the situation before 89 in Russia? I think yes. There is, uh, there is a demand for this uh, firm hand. And uh, in, in some sense, I would even say that uh, Putin uh, may not be the, the firm hand that these people want to see. They, they want to see something even uh, worse, some of them. I mean, there are, of course, all ranges of opinions in Russia. And there are many people who don't want uh, to see anything like that. But there are also many people who uh, believe in simple solutions, who believe that, okay, uh, yeah, we have a lot of problems here. We have a lot of chaos, a lot of corruption. So we just need somebody who will uh, imprison all of these, uh, or even shoot all of these um, uh, thieves, and everything will somehow fix uh, on its own. Of course, yeah, this person has to be, uh, to be just. So there is more, I would say, uh, demand for justice than for ruthlessness. Uh, but for many people, they just want a 
simple, quick so solution. And there is a lot of nostalgia. Um, in part, it is generated by the government propaganda. And it, in turn, uh, helps this propaganda and uh, directs this propaganda because the government is telling people what they want to hear and the people hear what the government is telling them and believe it and want to, to hear more. This is uh, this precious circle uh, when uh, there is no easy way out of this, right? Uh, the, one of the problems is that even some of the young people who have never lived uh, in the Soviet Union, who only know about it uh, in, at best from textbooks, at worst from uh, some propaganda shows on television, uh, even they want uh, return to some idealized Soviet past, uh, which they often know very little about. Like, oh, everything was very cheap, uh, it was very safe, there was no corruption, uh, and basically it was just some heaven and earth that for some unknown reason uh, crumbled uh, and fell apart. We, we don't understand why, but we want it back. Uh, this is very dangerous. I think we also have it in many countries uh, in Europe, uh, probably in Romania as well, and certainly in many post-Soviet countries too. Yeah, I actually want to have um, a question in the same direction. Uh, the nostalgic view in relation to uh, global affairs, because recently we've seen um, that Russia mingled in the American elections, in Brexit. Um, they, uh, it seems that there are intentions for the upcoming European elections, and for sure we, we've seen some uh, uh, mingling in the Romanian uh, society and elections. Is there any, are there any debates or discussions among the people themselves, not, uh, not the establishment, but about uh, with the people, if, if they are um, accepting it, this kind of mingling, if they are challenging it? Um, yeah. um, it seems to me that most people just don't think about it usually. Uh, this is mostly a game that uh, people uh, in the Kremlin like to play or uh, politologists like to discuss, but for the ordinary citizen, doesn't. first it's very complicated, uh, it's very opaque, they don't understand what really is happening, uh, and why should they care, right, about a country that, they have never been to, and, prob and probably will never be. Uh, so there isn't much dis of a discussion. I don't think it's something that people really want to see. We want more um, more Russian meddling uh, in foreign affairs. They don't care. Uh, a lot of people cared about the annexation of Crimea because it's very simple. Again, it's a simple solution. There is this territory used to be a, a different country, now it's our country. What's bad about it, right? Um, but with uh, election meddling, no, I don't think people care. Can I add something? I also think that uh, uh, people who appear on Russian state-owned, of course, television, are often, uh, often employ a anti-Western rhetoric which uh, is somehow absorbed by the population. And this somehow may be the answer to the fact that people do uh, support their, uh, the, this, these actions of the Russian government because this is what they hear on the television, isn't it? Well, yeah, like I said, uh, propaganda is quite, quite effective. It is not 100% effective, <clears throat> but uh, television is still the most popular source of uh, information, especially political information uh, in Russia. Uh, and why, uh, why should the government care uh, about, about the West, right? Uh, again, the vast majority of Russians have never been abroad. Uh, I think the last figures I saw was something like 90% of Russians have never gone abroad. Uh, it's only 10% and even among those 10% most uh, went to Turkey or Egypt uh, to the seaside. Uh, 
So they haven't seen any democracy, especially they, even if they went, uh, I don't know, to Montenegro or to Bulgaria, uh, they didn't go there to observe elections uh, or even to, to live uh, a, a life of an ordinary citizen. Uh, they were there as tourists. But uh, the government still realizes that uh, the model that the European Union presents, that uh, the Western democracy in general presents, is an alternative. And as long as there is this alternative, uh, there will be people who want to try it. Uh, so this is why it is the Kremlin is so interested in smearing uh, all uh, everything that's related to democracy to show, look, there is no real democracy anywhere. And, well, there is no perfect democracy anywhere. That's true. Uh, look, there, uh, all countries in the world are corrupt. And, of course, there is really corruption in every uh, country in the world. Uh, so, in every pro uh, piece of propaganda, there is uh, this grain of uh, truth, uh, which which just is just distorted uh, to look like um, uh, like truth, but uh, becomes a lie. Um, yeah, so I think that the, the real reason for this uh, anti-Western propaganda is domestic. They want to stay in power indefinitely. They don't want people to demand uh, accountability, to demand uh, succession of power, to demand free elections, to demand freedom of speech, because well, uh, Putin, uh, he saw, although from Germany, he lived in Germany at that time, he saw perestroika, and I'm sure Putin considers perestroika a terrible mistake, or maybe he considers it uh, a plot uh, by, I don't know, Washington, CIA. Uh, and he doesn't want to repeat it. He thinks that if you just give a little bit of freedom to these people, they'll tear the country apart and you'll lose power. So you have to keep everything uh, in your fist. It's great to have you with us, uh, Oleg. Thank you. And, and in, very encouraging under the circumstances. Uh, I watched those um, quite intimate moments with the, the um, cameraman and Putin in the car, and there was on other occasions when Putin talks about um, uh, living in a democracy and how we have democratic um, uh, institutions and, and, and therefore I feel secure, uh, something like that. What, what, what is Putin's democracy for him, for him as he sees it? Well, I can't look into Putin's brain uh, and I think uh, if anything, he, uh, he showed over the last 20 years that he's a very good actor. He knows what to tell to every particular person. Uh, so especially uh, in his first decade in power, uh, he managed very, uh, well, with, with great talent to look like a communist when he was talking to communists, a Democrat when he was talking to Democrats, uh, like a nationalist when he was talking to nationalists, and everybody believed him. Uh, at one point, um, I would say it was in 2012, when he returned uh, to his third uh, presidential term, uh, it, did, it stopped working already because uh, at least Democrats uh, or liberals, they stopped believing it. So he, he had to choose some path. But nobody knows what he really is. Uh, I think just by knowing his, some of his biography, uh, that one, uh, of course, he is a career uh, KGB officer. Uh, so he's trained in this kind of, uh, kind of art of deception. He's uh, uh, an, a government official, a public official, and a lawyer by training. So especially in his first year, first several years uh, in power, you could here, his language was oftentimes very cumbersome. It sounded like an official report, not like some live speech. Uh, because I think in his mind, he was still writing some report for the higher-ups when he was talking to 
to the cameraman. Now he learned uh, a bit better to sound uh, less formal. But also he lived uh, 10 years before this in what looked like a democratic or proto-democratic country. Uh, and he learned all these necessary words that you had to say. He heard them on TV every day. Yeltsin said them and uh, everybody around Yeltsin would say them. Again, it doesn't mean they believed all of this. But this, you had to say it. And he still says it. He still says that, yes, we are a democratic country. We have our democratic institutions that we have to protect. We don't want, now he adds that we don't want a democracy like they have in the West because they have a lot of problems. Our democracy is superior, uh, but he will never say, uh, like, we are an authoritarian country and I want to be present forever. Um, so I, I just wouldn't take it very seriously, although uh, it's interesting to, to see the nuances how his uh, words have changed over these 20 years. If you were to say that, that he has like a main political purpose for his ruling, a main great, a great goal uh, to leave behind, because he says uh, in the footage, he says he doesn't want to be a monarch or rule forever. And as a by question to that, how much do you think he meant some, some of the things he said on camera or what, was it all pretending for the main end? Um, with the second question, of course, like I said, I can't look into his brain. Probably, possibly, uh, especially in the first years uh, in office, he didn't know uh, whether he would be able or whether he would want to stay longer. And it's likely that he really thought, okay, eight years or even four years is quite a long term. Eight years is a long time. So perhaps I will do something in these eight years and then uh, uh, retire. Uh, but as time went by and he was consolidating more and more power, he became um, a sort of uh, um, hostage to this uh, power because he cannot let it uh, out. If uh, He knows that if the opposition, uh, any sort of opposition, left opposition or right opposition, liberals or communists, uh, wherever, come to power, they will start asking questions, they will start looking at what has happened over these years, and there will be many questions he would not like to be asked, uh, he would not like to answer. Uh, so, but possibly it will mean for him and for people, for his friends, some of them maybe will have to go to prison, some will have uh, to lose their assets that they've accumulated over these years. So he has too much to lose, and he cannot let it out, right? Maybe he already now wants to retire, but he can't. Uh, it's, actually it's a tragedy, both for, for him personally and for the country. Um, uh, and the, the first question... Uh, if you think he has a main goal... Like a main goal? Yeah, we part, partly answered... I don't know. Um, I, I don't know. I think he, he has several <laughs> objectives. Uh, one of them is very cynical, to stay in power as, as much as he can, as long as he can. Uh, like I said, he has to do it, because otherwise uh, he cannot be certain of his uh, own physical and political and historical survival. Uh, Yeltsin has had this problem. This is the reason why Yeltsin appointed Putin, uh, effectively appointed Putin as uh, successor. Uh, Yeltsin was very unpopular in the last years of his rule, and he realized that if his uh, arch enemy, the communists, come to power, they can imprison him. They will undo all the reforms that he had done, uh, even though these reforms were never actually completed. Uh, so he was looking for, some, for somebody uh, who would be popular enough to, to win the presidency, but who would be loyal enough to, uh, to keep uh, his promises and to, to keep Yeltsin secure and his uh, achievements secure. So he chose Putin. Uh, Putin has the same problem, but he doesn't trust anyone. Uh, and I don't think there will be another Medvedev storm, I think. But at the same time, 
I think he also sees himself um, a statesman in addition to just being a head of a clan. Um, and probably he, he wants to have some place in the textbooks. Uh, probably he sees it, especially since Crimea, since uh, uh, 2014, he sees it more as a uh, some sort of geopolitical maneuvering or geopolitical um, adventurism. Uh, try to use any opportunities uh, that uh, international politics allow uh, to uh, to use uh, his power to to increase Russia's uh, influence. Uh, what is the the final goal to this influence? I'm not sure. I don't think he asked this question. It's just uh, you know he believes. I think he believes in a zero sum game. So. If we want uh, Russia to be something bigger, something greater, then we need to have uh, everybody around weaker. Uh, and this is just what he pursues. I don't think he has any deep ideology. He's not a communist. Uh, he's not a liberal. He's not a, a Christian conservative. Uh, whatever he uh, pretends to be, I, I don't believe he has any specific ideology. Um. I have a more personal question for you. You said you were imprisoned by the authorities for your activism. Uh, were you afraid to speak your mind and to fight for your ideas? And if you were afraid, how did you manage to overcome this fear and still fight? Well, uh, I think I was lucky enough uh, in, in uh, the time when, when I uh, came, uh, uh, when, when I grew up. First, uh, I was lucky enough to live in the 1990s when there was this freedom of, uh, at, there was, like I said, uh, a very difficult economical situation, but there was a lot of freedom of speech. You could say whatever you wanted. You could uh, criticize Yeltsin or you, or you could uh, uh, criticize his opponents. You could say anything. Uh, nobody would put you to, to prison for that. You could protest against anything. Nobody would uh, imprison you for that as well. Even uh, the people who in 1993 uh, uh, were uh, in uh, an armed struggle against Yeltsin, uh, you've seen these uh, uh, photos, uh, this, this brief footage of the burning uh, White House. The, it was the seat of parliament at that time. Uh, even those people only spent about six months in jail. Uh, and they were amnested and let go. And one of them became um, a governor after that. So people didn't really go to prison uh, for speaking out. And this is, I was lucky enough to, to learn it and not to be really afraid. Uh, and second, Putin's um, autocracy also didn't happen overnight, as you saw. Uh, it was happening very slowly. So in uh, I was arrested for the first time in 2005, uh, five years into Putin's rule. And it was, by today's standards, it, it was very mild. Uh, some policemen wrote some papers and let me go after a couple of hours. And when I went out of the police station, everybody looked at me like a hero. <laughs> you survived it. You've been there for two hours and you haven't broken. Uh, it, it sounds really funny today, but at, at that time it was already something unusual. It was still something unusual, like somebody got arrested for protesting. Wow! Um, a couple of years later, it was uh, it wasn't already unusual to get arrested, but it was quite a heroic act to spend a few days in jail. Uh, so when I did that again, uh, I was uh, greeted uh, like another hero. Um, after uh, another several days um, in so-called administrative detention. Uh, now, unfortunately, it is already, uh, it doesn't even uh, count uh, if you spend just a night uh, in jail, nobody cares about it. Uh, I mean, except maybe yourself and your family and your closest friends. Uh, and. What counts now is only criminal cases where people can actually go to prison for years. So we, we saw this gradual increase in the level of repression 
uh, like I said, I was lucky enough to, to, to go through it gradually, so I was able to adapt. Uh, I think the young people of today, uh, who oftentimes get arrested in their first protest, peaceful protest again. We, in Russia, we are lucky not to have any violent protests at all. But if you get arrested at, at your first peaceful protest, and uh, you spend several days uh, in jail for that, you can be discharged from your university for this, or you can have uh, problems at your job if you have a job, uh, or you can have uh, you can face a serious fine, uh, which is roughly uh, about the average monthly income in Russia. Uh, so it, it is already a greater problem, and still I see that uh, hundreds and hundreds thousands of people show up, even for the protests where the government announces that they will be arresting people. Uh, so, in my time, when the worst you could face was a tiny uh, fine of 500 to 1,000 rubles, it was roughly um, a few uh, cups of coffee uh, and a couple of hours uh, at the police station, people were more reluctant to take part in protests. So I think people can get used to everything. This is, uh, I'm not sure if it's, if it's optimistic, but um, it's not uh, as bad as it could be. Yeah. Hi, um, thank you for being here. I had a question on, um, so the succession plan of Putin, but you already addressed that. But my question is what happens in 2024 now? So he has five years left of this term. Is there anything he's trying to put in practice again for being able to run, or is Medvedev going to be president again, or does he have any plans regarding this? And the other thing, um, if he wants to stay in power forever, he's only 66, so we might see him there for another 20 years. Are the Russians resigned to this, and should we be resigned to this as well, or is there, you know, growing discontent in the society when looking at, you know, another 20 years of him there? Thank you. Um, thank you. Two tough questions. Um, uh, first, Putin never quite told me what he planned for 2024, uh, and I'm not sure he knows it himself. Uh, there are millions of possible uh, combinations that could happen, uh, but his behavior teaches us that he doesn't really go for this very tricky and complicated things usually tries uh, to do things quite simply. Uh, but there are some things I would rule out. I think there won't be another successor, like another Medvedev uh, uh, for six years. Uh, first, because I think Putin considered, again, Medvedev a failure. Because uh, if you watched um, what happened in Russia uh, uh, between 2011 and 2012, and for some time after that, when Medvedev, uh, Medvedev had been in power in the Kremlin, not in power, for four, for four years, uh, it ended with uh, a sort of a civil uprising. Uh, people said that they want a different president, they don't want Putin to come back. Uh, and it was the biggest crisis, the biggest political crisis uh, in Putin's uh, career, uh, in, in, at least in Putin's time in power. Uh, so I, I don't think he, uh, he will want another uh, try to put somebody else like Medvedev in charge because he thinks they, they won't uh, hold power probably enough. Uh, but also because of the age. You see, he, will, he is uh, uh, 66 now, he will be 71 uh, in five years. And if Medvedev is in power, is in the Kremlin for another six years, Putin will be 77. So he will be in pretty advanced age, uh, and we don't know what kind of health he's going to have, and nobody knows, right? Uh, especially people um, in that age, they don't know whether they're going to have any problems with health uh, within six or seven years. So the big chance is that Medvedev will stay in power. Uh, I don't think Putin wants it. So uh, I think there isn't going to be another interim president. Uh, either he will, in any case, this will require change in the constitution. Uh, 
he may just abolish term limits like Lukashenko did in uh, Belarus. He held, uh, Lukashenko held a referendum. In Russia, you don't even need to hold, to hold a referendum. You could do it in like three weeks. Uh, have the parliament vote for it, have uh, some regional assemblies vote for it, sign it into law. That's it. Uh, pretty easy. Uh, doesn't look good, doesn't look very democratic, but, um, well, you have to, uh, to explain it to the people and they will certainly find the explanation. Like, you know, in this hard time, uh, you don't want to experiment with another leader when you have Putin. Um, it, it could be a switch to a parliamentary form, also something discussed, but I think the, the first option is more clear. This could be uh, some kind of uh, un unification with Belarus. Again, it's been discussed very uh, widely in the last several months. Uh, there are many options, uh, and Putin will only let us know when he thinks we should know. <laughs> which is uh, the last moment. Um, I have another question. Um, what does uh, the democratic opposition or the civil society do in face of uh, these challenges that come from uh, Russia's today, Russia's power? Well, they continue to work. Uh, and I think this is... Uh, uh, this is already um, an achievement because in spite of this uh, 19 years of increased uh, pressure, like I, I mentioned it with uh, arrests for protests, but it also works in all other areas, uh, in freedom of speech, uh, in um, uh, financing of NGOs or wherever, any area of uh, civil society uh, or civil, civic activism has experienced this uh, gradual worsening of the situation. Sometimes it's uh, very quick, sometimes it's uh, very gradual. Uh, but they continue to work in spite of this. Uh, I would say that there are more civic activists now than there were 10 years ago and more than there were 20 years ago. Uh, a lot of young people um, now look very different at it. When I was... Uh, when uh, it was like 2000 and 2001 and I was a student, uh, all my friends, uh, when I told them I'm a volunteer at a human rights group, uh, they had the first question they asked, so uh, how much are you getting paid? I said, no, it's, it's a volunteer work. I, I'm not getting paid actually. I'm uh, putting some of my money into that, like pocket money. Uh, so can you steal something from me? No, there is nothing to steal. Oh, you, so you're probably going to, to be a big boss in the government soon. And I was like, no, you see, uh, this is a human rights group and this is uh, an opposition party. I'm not going to make a career anytime soon. And so the last um, verdict was, okay, so we see you're a bit crazy. That's fine. We just, uh, we'll just uh, stay away from you. Uh, they didn't understand uh, why would anyone spend their time and especially risk anything uh, not for themselves? Doesn't make sense. Uh, now it's different. Uh, it's not universal, again, so the majority of young people are also quite passive still, but uh, uh, a quickly growing minority uh, is much, much more active. Uh, I think two years ago, almost probably two years ago to the day, uh, was um, a big protest uh, in Moscow and in other cities uh, against um, corruption in the government, sparked by um, a film by Alexei Navalny about Medvedev, who was also present in this film, um, which showed corruption of Medvedev. And uh, for the first time, we saw uh, that a big uh, maybe the biggest part of this protest uh, were very young people, sometimes um, school students, like 14, 15, 16 years old. Uh, it was very unusual, and the government was and is still very much afraid. Just uh, a couple months ago, they passed a new law uh, that 
uh, imposes a fine or again administrative detention for anyone who invites uh, an underage person uh, to a protest, to an unsanctioned protest, but effectively a protest unsanctioned. Um, so things, I think, are getting better for the civil society in this respect. We don't know uh, which side will win eventually. And this goes uh, back to your second question, which I didn't answer, uh, whether we should just uh, be prepared to wait for another 20 years until the natural change um, of uh, power, uh, or should we expect something else? Uh, I think uh, uh, my, uh, by training I'm a political scientist, and I think it's, it's probably one of the worst professions in the world. Don't take it. Um, but uh, while uh, doing this education, I read a, a, quite a few books about um, changing of power uh, in Europe and in other places, uh, especially of authoritarian governments. Uh, and the only thing, uh, the main thing probably I could uh, understand from it is that uh, six months before each such uh, succession, the brightest, the best experts uh, in that country or about that country would never predict it would happen. Uh, these are things that nobody can reliably predict. And if they do predict, they're probably lying and they're, or they're mistaken. Uh, so I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, I don't know, um, it may take 20 years. It may take five years or one year. Uh, it's really impossible to predict. The only thing we can do is uh, to do what is, part, what is in our uh, capacity uh, to keep alive the civil society and to promote uh, the ideas of democracy, of human rights, um, of rule of law, um, accountability of the government. Uh, and eventually, I think these seeds will, will sprout. Um, if there are no more questions, um, let me just thank Oleg for uh, being such a wonderful guest and answering uh, the questions so fully. Thank you very much for your questions and for listening to me this Saturday evening.